recording and we're good to go. Sounds great. Thank you so much for setting that up. Oh, no worries. Uh, we're looking at ways to automate that process. So uh -huh. uh, one of the challenges is we sometimes like um, a meeting doesn't happen, like it gets canceled and one person shows up and suddenly the recording starts. So we, we're, mm -hmm. Rye and I are, well, Rye has done all the hard work. Um, we're looking uh -huh. at how to automate this so that when you start the meeting, it just happens. Here we go. And we've got awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the BC yeah. show. that's great. Oh, you can see my screen. It looks good. I can see your screen and I see uh, Telegram Sam has joined us. Wonderful. Welcome, Sam. And set char to co host. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Hey, Tim. Hey, co -host. Good morning. All right, Char, you're the co host. Thank and you. If there's ever anybody else you want added as co host, just let me know. Okay. Great, it's good to know. Uh, I generally have a policy that we turn on co-host or, or or have someone else's host because uh, internet goes down. We don't want the yeah. end because one person is, you know, the the point of failure. So yeah, yeah, that happened once before. <laughs> yes, yeah, um, again, so. super fun. Thanks, Zoom. You're the best. Very fun. <laughs> Although the alternatives are not even probably shouldn't say that on a recording, but yeah. <laughs> Cool. Uh, let's see. Where our, our speaker today is Clacio of BC Gov. So let's wait until we see him on the call. Go ahead. Hi, Maria. Thanks for joining the call. Hi. We'll get started in, in just a few minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, Clacio. Hello, good morning. Good morning. All right, let's see. We can probably go ahead and get started. We're already recording, so that's great. Uh, let's see. Welcome, everyone, to the uh, Hyperledger Identity Special Interest Group call for May 4th, 2023. Thanks everybody for joining us today. My name is Shar Howland. I'm a, a co-chair of this group with Vipin Barathon and Tim Spring. So today we will talk about, um, we'll talk a bit about the change of this group from a working group um, to a special interest group and our, our merge with the identity working group, which we're really excited about. We'll also go over working group status updates, and we will hear a presentation from Clacio uh, Varjao of BC Gov um, on Aries Bifold and the BC Wallet. So thanks so much for joining us today, Clacio. This is a Linux Foundation call, and so we are following the um, Linux Foundation uh, antitrust policy, as well as the Hyperledger code of conduct, both of which are, are linked and written here. This call is, of, of course, being recorded and uh, streamed on YouTube. I will post the recording on this meeting page later today, and I'll send out this page in the chat. Let's see, if you want to write your name on the attendees list, that would be wonderful. Always fun to um, be able to see who's attending our calls. And um, I think we have some new faces on the call today. Would anybody like to take a moment to introduce themselves, say what, whatever you wanna say, a, a brief introduction of yourself, what has brought you to the space, um, what you're working on. So would, would love to hear from any new people on the call. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chang Lu, and uh, currently I'm a research manager at uh, Blockchain ABC, uh, a blockchain research cluster at the University of British Columbia. And uh, before I beca became the research manager, I was a postdoc research fellow at the research cluster. And uh, I have a PhD in business uh, focused on strategic management and organization. My research area is uh, blockchain adoption in healthcare. Uh, I'm very excited to to meet everyone and learn from everyone. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks so much for joining the call, Chang. Thank you. Great to have you on. Uh, Sean, it looks like your hand is up. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Sean Bohan. I am a uh, community architect at Hyperledger. Um, I've been in and out of the Hyperledger community for the last <clears throat> six years. Uh, this week was the uh, sixth anniversary of Indy being accepted into Hyperledger uh, as a project, which was pretty weird to see pop up. Um, and uh, I am here, I'll be on a lot of these calls going forward um, now that uh, we have an identity SIG. Uh, we are live streaming this to YouTube, so if folks want to watch it live or if they want to watch it later on, we have an Identity SIG playlist on the Hyperledger YouTube. And uh, if anybody needs to reach me, you can find me on Discord. Uh, just pop a note in Community Architects. Um, it's, I monitor that all day long. But also, um, you know, whether you're in the Indy or the areas of the non-creds uh, community, welcome. And uh, thank you for Char for leading on this. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sean. Would anybody else like to introduce themselves? All right. Let's see. Uh, a few announcements worth mentioning. There is an, a non-creds workshop on May 31st. Here's the link to register. Um, that'll be great. So definitely encourage everybody to attend. Uh, let's see. Another announcement, of course, is our, our merge with the identity working group and um, becoming a, a special interest group. I was thinking it'd be nice to talk a bit about what that means, what, what that is going to look like, uh, maybe reintroduce our, our co-chairs, um, Vipin, Tim, and myself. Uh, but bef before we jump into that, are there any other announcements that anybody has or any introductions that anybody would like to make? All right, wonderful. So Tim Spring and I have been co-chairing the Hyperledger Identity Implementers Working Group call for, for a while. And um, Vipin Barathon of DLT NYC has been leading the Identity Working Group. So we're really excited to join forces and become a special interest group instead of a working group. This fits better what we do here, where it's a roundup of community news and working group progress updates, presentations and demos, rather than a, a technical project that we're developing together. So we're excited to consolidate the existing communities and, and resources of these working groups. Um, it's really wanting it, it to be an, an entry point for newcomers, a place to ask questions, community, news there are, are so many calls too many to attend all of them so so this gives the the brief updates on what is going on so those are those are some of the the main goals um collaborating across hyperledger identity projects and collaborating with other other special interest groups that focus on identity as well um leading outreach to other linux foundation identity communities of course we we track updates in the TYP and the DIF, um, which is great. Also um, bringing in speakers to talk about uh, a deep dive of, of interesting topics or demos. Um, and yeah, creating a, a forum for members to um, engage in the identity conversation within Hyperledger and um, yeah, have a, a, a place to, to host that conversation. So, yeah, just wanting to open it up. Um, if anyone has questions about this change, we're also always um, appreciating feedback. Um, if anybody has suggestions on how we run these calls, format or content changes, um, would love to hear that as well. We could also probably do a, a brief introduction of, of uh, reintroduction of our co-chairs. Um, Tim and Vipin, if, if you're willing, I, I can I can start. Um, my name is Shar, and I 
work at NDCO as a software engineer. I've been I mainly worked um, on projects related to Hyperledger, Aries, and Indy. Um, I'm an active developer on the Aries Cloud Agent Python wow. ecosystem, um, developing plugins and other purpose-built agents and protocols. And then I'm involved as a co-chair of the Hyperledger Indy Contributors Working Group, and of course this one as well. But um, Tim and Vipin, would you like to jump in with a brief introduction of yourself? Tim, sure. Go ahead, Vipin. No, I, I said, you know, I'm waiting for you. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Tim Spring. Uh, I'm a marketing director at Indicio, and I try to help line up speakers and do any uh, any help in uh, promoting the group. So that's kind of what I try to bring to the table. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vipin Bharathan. I've been running the um, identity working group uh, for quite a while. Um, in fact, the identity working group started almost uh, at the same time as the, uh, you know, the Hyperledger itself. In the first meeting, first hackathon get together, we uh, started the group. Uh, it was first chaired uh, by uh, one of the legends in, in the space. Um, then it got taken over. Uh, it got basically it got orphaned and I, I jumped in to take it over. And um, we launched almost all the projects that are now flourishing. Uh, we were the mothership. Uh, Indy was launched inside the identity uh, working group and also Aries and many others. And I'm so glad to see that it's all thriving. And we um, also did, um, um, we also uh, differentiate, I mean, the uh, Identity Implementers Working Group started as a uh, uh, sort of a tactical uh, group for reporting on the work in progress of all the, uh, all the work that is going on in the identity space. Um, in terms of the differentiation between the two, it used to be that the identity working group proper was where um, a strategic sort of mission was uh, um, presented uh, and the specific project details were presented in the implementers work, working group. Identity working group as uh, um, as not as active as the implementers working group because obviously the projects are very alive. So I'm glad to see this new life uh, being injected into the system and uh, we will take it forward from there. And hopefully we'll have uh, some presentations that are focused more on a strategic vision, uh, especially integration with other projects because identity by itself is not very exciting, at least for me, because it, it, is, um, it is the foundational aspect of identity for all different projects, meaning healthcare, uh, financial markets, anything you, you touch has an identity component. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, the identity working group used to focus. Now identity SIG will have these twin uh, paths, uh, but obviously not very divergent. Uh, thanks for uh, restarting, uh, you know, rebooting this whole concept uh, to Sean, who is now our new point of contact. And that will be all. I'm, eager to hear what uh, the presenter has to say. Likewise. Yeah, thanks, thanks Vipin for that um, bit of history. That's great to hear and really excited to um, join forces.
All right, before we jump into the agenda, does anybody have any questions about the change in the working group? Any announcements or introductions? All right. So let's jump into the agenda for um, the working groups that we track. I, did I see a, a hand up? Oh, okay, well, feel, feel free to jump in anytime. Uh, let's see. So usually uh, we spend the first uh, part of the call going over working group updates, and then we turn it over to the speaker to give their, their presentation or demo. So we will start with these, these working groups that we track. I'll send the wiki out in the chat again for those who have joined more recently. So in the Indie Contributors call, we um, we are um, making good good progress on the Sovereign Node pipeline um, there. So in, there's been some some branch switching happening. Main got switched to Ubuntu 16.04, and the um, Ubuntu 20.04 branch became main. This is a, a part of the um, upgrade to Ubuntu 20.04. And so there's testing happening. Um, there's some branch comparison work yet to finish up, but working towards an official uh, release, which is really exciting. Also scoping out the um, top priority tasks on the Indie roadmap that we have developed recently, and especially repo cleanup is what we're starting with. So going through um, open PRs and figuring out uh, what we want to do with them, retarget them to the right branch again or close them. So that is all going well. In the um, Aries working group, uh, Sam, would you want to jump in with any updates there? Yes, sorry, I just took a bite of food. No um, worries. The um, discussion we uh, we had is, is pretty relevant. We're talking about uh, transitioning um, the legacy use of unqualified dids and some indie projects over to did peer method two. Um, also a did peer method three, which is a which, which is an efficient uh, synonym for uh, did peer two, um, and then that the, that will be leveraged into into that conversion in anticipation of our continued work on defining AIP three. That's our quick summary. Very cool. Thank you. All right, uh, Aries bifold. Anybody? Attend that group would like to report. Um, Clacio, you, you're probably pretty involved in that one. Um, yes, I do. Uh, I think we're in the previous one. There hasn't been any major changes. Um, again, we're working on the component, creating more components, um, breaking down to more components that are reusable for different use cases and different applications. Wonderful. Thanks for that update. Let's see, in the Aries Collision Python user group, uh, we had an, an update from the Indicio team on our basic of code with us to upgrade Akapai to use the Hyperledger implementation of a non-cred. So um, we've been working on revocation support, um, assist, uh, reassessing the um, existing revocation components to figure out what we can reuse there. Um, so, yeah, mainly mainly working on revocation there. Some some tails file issues we've had to solve, um, but next we're we're looking at working on um, documentation, creating a a, a non creds method plugin author guide so that there's um, enough documentation that people can can create their own own plugins, um, and then unit and integration tests as well. Um, uh, another thing discussed on that call was um, talking about converting an Akapai deployment to use Aries Askar. Um, so Wade Barnes talked about some some lessons learned there, which was which was interesting to hear. All right, in the um, Aries framework JavaScript call, did anybody attend this one who'd like to report on their progress? Um, today's meetings got canceled, so I don't think there has been any major change upgrades there. Um, I know, as, as you had already mentioned, in, in this, um, sorry, Animo is working on 
on some of those in the VDR replacements as well, an introduction to uh, removing in the SDK, replacing with the uh, NVDR, shared, R shared RS and ASCAR and, and all that. Um, that's one of the major changes going on at that space. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for that update. All right, in Hyperledger Ursa, bit of a big announcement here. Um, Ursa is being end of life. Um, there has not been so much recent development or time from maintainers. Um, there's a, a some discussion on this PR linked here if you're interested in, in looking at that, but it, it looks like the pieces um, that other Hyperledger projects depend on with Ursa will be um, moved into those projects, um, which are Anon Creds, Indy, Aries, and Iroha. So the CL signatures part will go into Anon Creds, BLS signatures going into Indy, and BBS signatures going into Aries. So yeah, that's that's a, a big change that's happening. Does anybody want to provide any more information there or any any questions on that? Uh, Char, I can I can pitch in just a little bit. So the Hyperledger staff had reached out to uh, Ursa stakeholders over the last couple of weeks to talk about uh, the status of Ursa, um, the, the progress of Ursa, and where Ursa is going. Um, the Ursa maintainers, um, in, a, in a discussion that we had with them, volunteered that there was a method by which they could help move the dependency components out of Ursa itself, so that we're not abandoning the projects that that leverage those components but also end of life versa. Um, as a follow on, we just had a conversation in the Hyperledger Technical uh, Oversight Committee about how we go about this in the future um, and making sure that we are not, uh, even though the, the maintainers were the ones who volunteered the PR, we're not rushing these decisions and the possibility of going to a step uh, before end of life so that there is some quiet period where folks can uh, can coordinate and make the decisions that they need to. Um, so yeah, so so we're gonna make some some uh, we're gonna make some changes, not from a governance perspective, but from an approach perspective, where we have projects in the future that need to go to end of life. Um, but at the same time, we also don't want to have projects that are hanging out there and abandoned, and other people are picking them up and using them as dependencies who we may not know about. It's open source; we don't know everyone who's using our code within the Hyperledger projects. Uh, so we wanna make sure that the, the projects that we have are being you know, maintained and updated. And so this is a pretty natural process. We end of life four or five projects last year. Um, this is just you know the grooming of the projects that we have and making sure that we have active communities that are not just being built, but ongoing. And um, so yeah, there's a lot of work going on right now in Aroha, Indian Aries land to accommodate for this change and Ursa going EOL. Yeah, thanks for that that context, Sean. Can I uh, say something here? Sure. Abs absolutely. Um, when a project reaches a certain maturity, um, the uh, contributions tail off, uh, but if the project is being used actively and it is a, actually a library, I don't understand this whole concept of end of life for that project and then pairing it apart and putting it into different, pro you know, different other projects. Um, you know, there are many projects out in open source that reach a certain level of maturity and after which uh, uh, they are being used all over the place. Um, sometimes with hidden bugs, as you know, like Log4j, um, which has been around for 14 years or so. But uh, the, the, the point is this whole end of life concept, um, uh, you know, it needs re-examining from that angle. Anyway, that's a different conversation somewhere else. But uh, as far as Ursa goes, uh, is the library itself, being archived in a, any state to be used or does it need uh, further development? Um, could you repeat the question, Vipin? 
the current um, current library, which is yep. Ursa, uh, can can it be used? Uh, you know, as a library for uh, the foreseeable future, or do we have to then now follow these? Uh, different pieces that are in different projects to get uh, you know future upgrades if, if someone wants to use the current library they can we are making we're putting a big disclaimer that it is an it is an end of life archive project with no active maintainers and not being actively maintained use at your own risk um what we what we're working on as a community right now is making sure that the projects that we know that have a dependency on ursa specifically Indy Aries and Aroha. Aroha was using Ursa. Um, they they are able to transition the components within Ursa that that they're using so they're not left high and dry. I still we we still have folks show up in like the Hyperledger Discord asking us about projects Avalon, which were deprecated a year ago. Um, or someone was using something in a project they stopped that project now they come back and they're like hey you know how come no one's updated this well we end of life it over a year ago like that that still happens and we we want to be um really considerate in how we approach this and then plus one to sam for not rushing you're, you're absolutely correct um we are we are looking from a process perspective how to make sure we're not rushing in the future um, but also we don't want to have ticking time bombs out there that we don't know about or a situation where the maintainers have moved on and we get a critical a critical vulnerability report and there's you know a scramble to find someone to work on it um so this is they're, they're, we're going to find a balance between um keeping things available and and maturity and at the same time being good stewards and and you know being good stewards of the projects that we have Yeah, we'll absolutely. take it up on a separate uh, thread, uh, Sean. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, all right, Hyperledger and non creds. Anybody attend this most recent working group meeting that would like to report? Looks like they are preparing for the um, non creds workshop that I mentioned at the end of the month. Um, and getting updates from the Anoncreds um, V2 working group as well, talking about um, Anoncreds in W3C, VC, and JWT formats. So lots of good work happening there. Let's see, those are the end of our hyperledger groups that we track. So onto the TOIP, and I'll try to move somewhat quickly through this so we make sure to have plenty of time for Clasio's presentation. As far as I could tell, there haven't been recent meetings of the all members meeting during committee or communications committee, but feel free to jump in if I am missing information there. Let's see, in the um, governance stack working group, um, they've been giving input on a third generation to a P stack diagram. Um, Looks like there are some other groups working on that as well. The um, Technology Architecture Task Force under the Technology Stack Working Group is also collaborating on that, as well as the um, TIP Glossary Workspace, which is near completion. Let's see. The um, Trust Registry Task Force has been focusing on EU comparison. So comparing with um, the EUDIARF, which is the European Union Digital Identity Architecture and Reference Framework, um, and then TRAIN, which is Trust Management Infrastructure. So comparisons with what's going on um, over in Europe. Let's see, the Trust Spanning Protocol Task Force as well has been having um, recent meetings and, and workshops which sounds like have been helpful towards making key decisions and they have another workshop planned today. Um, no I'm, ACDC. I'm speaking yet. at that one, by the way. Oh, great. Today. Yeah, uh, today. Yeah. 
Nice. What, what's the main topic for today? <clears throat> so I'm going to propose a hybrid uh, between the encryption and signing stuff that uh, Sam Smith has been working on and proposing and the relevant pieces of the uh, DIDCOM 2.1 spec um, that, uh, that allows us to gain both the advanced crypto that uh, is desired, but also leverage the existing work, but also in a way that allows for independent um, layers of the stack to be augmented or replaced later uh, as we get smarter moving forward. So there's been lots of discussions and sort of various proposals all over the spectrum. And this is my attempt to propose what I think is this is the cleanest way forward, getting the benefits that we want without uh, taking any unnecessary time or having to reinvent the universe. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I look forward to hearing about that, that workshop. The looks like in the AI and, and metaverse technology task force, Daniel Bockenheimer um, has been talking about biometrics. Uh, let's see. The utility foundry group, um, they're on hiatus, um, still working with the governance architecture task force. And let's see. I don't believe the ecosystem foundry group has met more recently than us and the concepts and technology uh, terminology um, working group has been working on their terminology engine version two um, as well as that technology stack working group glossary workspace we talked about um you now i kind of breeze through these uh two ip updates does anybody have any more uh, specific specifics or details to add from any of these working groups? Uh, Sandy, it looks like you you came off mute. Did you want to add anything? All right, so moving on to the Decentralized Identity Foundation, we've got the um, Ducom Spec Working Group, who I guess it was the first Monday of the month, this past Monday. Um, let's see, Sam, do you want to give any updates on the goings on there? Um, yep, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the, the possible uh, work with the trust banning protocol. Um, and that we also are finalizing uh, and, and actually like next hour in 30 minutes, I'll be um, seeking a, approval from the, uh, the DIP steering committee on turning that dot one release into a ratified specification. I don't anticipate any issues there. The changes made uh, in make it easier for ION uh, to, to use DIDCOM. There was a accident of the timeline and that ION was finalized just prior to the spec and then DIDCOM ended up going a different direction for its, its um, and, and chose the one thing that ION doesn't support for its uh, endpoint uh, definitions. And so a, a mild expansion of the spec allows for um, ION to use it easier. Um, mm -hmm. The DIDCOM was spec compliant before and after, uh, but expanding it a little bit makes it easier for that community. And so that's what ah. the dot one release is. Wonderful, thanks for that update. Hey, Char, I think I was, I've been having audio issues the whole day long. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks. So I, I was just going to add something on and for the uh, AI and uh, Metaverse Task Taskforce from TUIP. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. yeah, we we'll meet bi-weekly over there and uh, we're working on, uh, yes, there were some conversations about biometrics from Dan and then also from Venging. Uh, we're, we're specifically looking into uh, something called, like uh, something called, uh, uh, authenticated content uh, from, say, Adobe and uh, other folks uh, like iProof, and and the focus over there has been that uh, uh, how do you really prove any given content? Like when you see some videos, something that's authentic and uh, it's not being uh, fabricated. Uh, mm -hmm. Given the advance in AI technologies, I mean that's uh, pretty feasible these days. So that's one thing, and there's also a couple of white papers going on. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the white papers I'm working on is that uh, identity and game uh, payments in gaming, and uh, and and because I also have an approved mentorship project under Hyperledger, uh, Misig, uh, Misig, uh which is by the way getting a little reorganized too, uh, and that white paper is actually in the topic of identity and payments, uh, like like essentially uh, creating a, a mini game. 
uh, and then and research hangar identity in payments and gaming and how we can extend that. So like, like essentially obviously focus being decentralized identity and payments uh, and payments. Wonderful. Thanks for thanks for those updates. Looking forward to hear hearing more about the white papers and great. Thank you. Absolutely. So well so on the white paper, just to add one thirty second thing on that is that as we're working on this mentorship project uh, under the high pleasure uh, projects, uh, so I'm gonna be doing some joint work with high pleasure and also uh, under TYP uh, to present the, the research uh, contents and, and what comes out of that. Wonderful. That's great that you're using the mentorship program for that. Yep, thank you. Awesome. Thank you for those updates. All right. Let's see. In the um, interoperability group, um, they've been having speakers join to talk about use cases, hearing about uh, pain points that they're addressing and why their technical decisions addressed specific pain points and seeking to recognize patterns and information um, in interoperability decision making. And they had a, a recent, um, I guess yesterday, they, they met um, and had a presentation on user adoption and interoperability from Dan um, Guresco. And let's see, in the IoT special interest group, um, They've also been been focusing specifically on use cases and sharing of interests and experiences for the direction of work in that group. Um, are there any other uh, decentralized identity foundation updates that anybody would like to jump in with? All right, in the W3C, um, as far as I could tell, there haven't been more recent meetings of the did working group, but um, let me know if I'm wrong. And in the community credentials group, they've been having their um, education task force call and um, traceability call um, last week. And it looks like next week they have a presentation on digital trust infrastructure for discovery and validation. So are there any other working group updates that anybody would like to give before we turn it over to Clasio for his presentation. Uh, you know, Sha, if I may, uh, on the CCG thing, uh, there was actually a bunch of presentations from put on uh, uh, from, from folks working in uh, uh, implementing uh, uh, DI but using SSI concepts in put on. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I'd like, I'm not gonna go into details, but I think you could probably share some of those things here, uh, like like give some have some links uh, come over here because they actually go live with uh, uh, in like like in, on the official government level. So that's okay. happening soon. They also try to basically have the airlines work with the neighboring countries like you know India and and, and other places uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to actually use the SSI for for you know for the actual uh, ID purposes. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for bringing that up. I. Um... It looks like the Ecosystem Foundry Group and the TYP recently had a meeting related to that. Um, yes, but if, if you have any links related to the, the discussions in the CCG group uh, that you could send my way, that would be wonderful. I can also look as well. So thank you for jumping in with that. Sure. All right. Um, let's see, I wanna make sure we have enough time for Clasio. So I will turn it over to you um, and give the screen share up. Okay. Um, can you hear me well? My yes. microphone? Okay. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Looks like my team, my You should be good now if you want to try again. Okay, I think I will need to restart my Zoom. Okay, just give me one second. No worries. Does anybody have any um, thoughts from IAW that they'd want to share? Anybody in this group attend? Clasio is back.
uh, let's see, I, I was able to go to IAW um, two weeks ago. It was my, my first time, so it's really fun to go and connect with people in the community. Um, there were lots of talks about AI and governance, lots of folks from the government as well joining and um, excited to collaborate. Um, I gave a session on the Hyperledger Indie Roadmap, so that was fun to spread the word about the work happening there. Um, and also talked about the launch of, of this group, the, the merge. So cool. That looks great, Clacio. I can't hear you though, if you are talking. Let's see, are, are others able to hear Clacio? Um, um, oh. was me. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, can you hear me now and see me now? <laughs> yes, yes, everything looks okay. great. All good. All right. Can you just tell me that you can see a browser in the middle and I have a phone on the right hand side? Yeah. Okay, so I'm sharing the right screen. That's good. Um, okay, so hi everyone. My name is Classio Vargel. I work for the government of British Columbia in Canada. Um, so we have been working on, on, on an app called BC Wallet, um, but we are, uh, have also been working on Ares by Fold, which is the upstream project for our app. Um, we, both of them are open source. Uh, of course, Hyperledger by Fold is open source, but also BC Wallet itself, we're also building, uh, uh, making that open source. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the community. Um, some of you are in this call as well. Some companies like IndiciaShar, um, Animo, and DSR. There's a number of companies, organizations around the world who have contributed in one way or another to, to either by Fold, AFJ, and a number of other projects that, uh, that really enable uh, this app to work. Um, one of the things that I would like to highlight, I think in Shar, you mentioned in the in the Akapai call, uh, there was conversations about moving to Askar. Uh, we were struggling with uh, with the mediator particularly, um, and how it was not scaling properly, it was not performing um, uh, in a, a satisfactory way. Um, so we have spent a lot of time investigating and and doing. Um, and doing some load testing, performance testing. And that's where we came to a conclusion that ask, uh, moving to Ascar would be our, our best direction other than um, um, come up with a new mediator service. Um, so we do have a demo. I, uh, at the end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post a link that you can see. I'm gonna run from a dev environment just because there's one feature that I wanna highlight, um, but I'll paste in chat the link if you wanna follow along um, now or later, um, that is, you're welcome to do so. Um, this is a live demo, so hopefully things will work, fingers crossed. Um, okay, so in BC, we, we do have this, um, um, showcase where we we provide a number of uh, use cases that are represented by those two persona. One, we have a student and a lawyer. Um, the lawyer showcase is the one that we have been working, actually working. It's in, in production in a limited release. Uh, we started pretty small with about, about 20 lawyers participating in the pilot program. And we are now have, hit, uh, have reached 200, over 200 lawyers who are participating now. And we expected that within the next two or three months to extend to the reminders of the lawyers, which is a, a total amount of about 14,000 lawyers would be potentially be using the system. Um, also, shout out to this demo. This demo is it's another working contribution from, from the open source community. We, we borrowed this from, from, from uh, Animo, so thank you very much. Uh, so if you go through the through this showcase, there is a there is a bunch of screens explaining a little bit. I'm not gonna go in details, but if you have the time, you can can read and, and try it out yourself. Um, it goes through the steps of uh, installing a installing BC Wallet, uh, a little bit of background on why 
uh, Law Society of BC are go is going digital, some, some explanation why it's important for court materials to go online. Um, we talk about Law Society of BC is the organization that regulates uh, the lawyer profession in BC. So they're the issuers and they have the authority to uh, to say who is a um, active good standing lawyer who are authorized to practice law in BC. Um, I I'm going to start by getting a lawyer credential um, in the I have my wallet ready here. The same process, I always scan a QR code. I will receive a credential offer with my lawyer membership card. Um, in the real production, as it is right now, uh, lawyers currently have access to a Law Society of BC member portal where they are able to enter their login, their username and password that they already have, and they're able to manage their own credentials. So they're able to issue a credential, revoke a credential, or reissue a credential. Um, it's important to hi highlight as well that the, the issuer, Law Society of BC, have implemented a business rule that there can only be one uh, active, uh, no revoked uh, credential at the time. So they do apply a business rule where whenever a new credential is issued, any active credential, at least the previous one, um, is automatically revoked. So the next, the next step is for going through this showcase, it's to get that per what we're calling to a person credential. Um, the person credential it's based on our um, BC services card program. Um, so that information, we already have them. We integrate with that BC services card holder app um, in a production environment. They can, they use their BC service card app and we leverage the identity proving that has been already been done. It has been going around for quite a few years. Uh, we have uh, recently reached a milestone where the BC service card app has been uh, has been installed over 2 million users, 2 million devices are currently using BC service card app. Um, and I'm going to show, explain a little bit uh, why we needed the both credentials. So we have here in my wallet, the Law Society uh, of BC member, member card, which tells uh, someone that yes, I'm a active, uh, good standing lawyer authorized to practice law in BC. Um, if at any time this change, a credential can be revoked by the Law Society of BC and the, users, uh, the user will be informed of that right away and verifiers um, would then have an option to, to request for approved non revocation and, and that's where uh, they would potentially lose access to some systems. Um, I'll go through the use case of going through the court services branch. Court services branch is providing a um, access to court materials online. Currently, the service that service is only provided in person. So, the biggest difference for difference for lawyers is that they no longer have to drive to the courthouse and go in person to access those those materials. They can do it now from from their own office, from their own from their own computer, anywhere. They have access to the internet. Um, this is the proof request that is that is going to be issued by the wallet. So once that proof request is satisfied, they then have access to to the system. Um, you can see here uh, on the proof request is showing two credentials. Um, one, the Law Society of BC. The other one is the person credential. Um, you're going to notice that the, this proof request does not ask for all information, but only what is the minimum information that is needed to access the system. Um, one other thing that from BC, we have very strong privacy laws in regards to tracking and uh, identifiers. You notice that we have made a decision and decided to not provide a, any unique identifier in the person credential. Um, the law member credential, they do have a uh, made ID, but from, from government right now, we are not offering a unique identifier. Uh, which might change over time, but this is where we are right now. Right now, there's there, there wasn't identified a need for, for the services that we were enabling. 
I receive approved requests. I can then um, accept and share that information. And the information is accepted on the on the side on the system. Um, some validation process. There is a, some other business rules here. For instance, they check that the, the first name and give family names they match. Um, there's a there has been a few situations where um, that where lawyers haven't updated the records and their name there's a mismatch either because they got married or they got divorced. Their names uh, hasn't been up, uh, officially updated yet. And, and there's also situations where, where lawyers prefer, we've noticed as well that particularly uh, potentially females, they prefer to go by their maiden name uh, when they're practicing law. Um, and that's a quick uh, demo of, of our showcase using the lawyer credential and the person credential. Um, I'm gonna pause here for a brief second if there is any question and I would like to do a demo of another feature the mobile verifier that is has been one that uh, has recently been uh, put in production I'll keep an eye for hands up uh, Shar can you let me know yeah yeah absolutely I, I had a quick question okay. too so in order to access the court records you need to use the person credential in addition to the lawyer credential? Is that to match the the names or why are both needed? Correct. Um, that's a, a, an interesting question. So the, the both credential it mimics the currently uh, kind of a manual in-person process for in order to keep or uh, the level of identity assurance, um, the request to provide two pieces of ID. Mm, so that would be the two pieces of ID. So one that is managed by the Law Society of BC, the other one managed by the government by a different party. So from a security and privacy perspective, the likelihood of two identities from different issues being compromised at the same time is relatively low, but also allow them to, to rely on the identity proving process on BC Service Card app and the government issue credentials are, are much higher than the ones from uh, Law Society of BC. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, uh, no problem. So another thing that I'm gonna demo is our mobile verifier uh, functionality that is recently has been, uh, we work with the community um, and it has been currently, it's in bifold. So all of these features, the features that I am talking about, it's in bifold. Um, so if you are planning on producing your own wallet, um, those all those features are readily available. Um, I'm gonna show you a trick. So if you are going through uh, the showcase yourself uh, later on, there is an option to enable dev mode where we have access to potentially some um, tech preview features. If you type the version of the app about 10 times, uh, you are unlocked. You can unlock developer options. And then develop options are gonna enable the functionality of user verifier capability. There are two capability, use the verifier capability. This is enable uh, connectionless proof request and the use connection provider capability, we will enable you to generate a, a QR code to connect, and you can then provide that, that, that connection um, proof request as well. So I will we'll do that, but I actually, I need to do on the verifier phone, which is on this other one. So I will redo this really quick. Okay, so once the, that, that feature has been unlocked, um, now you're gonna see those two options. One, one is proof request and approve request, the other one is connection to, to invite. Um, the reason being that those features are gated for now, we're not entirely sure how to present that in a user-friendly way. Um, our user, uh, user researcher and user, user experience has been doing some research and, and doing some, some analysis and, and prototyping about how the users would better um, understand this feature. Um, from this one, I'm gonna send a proof request. Um, as proof requests right now, we have decided to 
uh, sort of embed baked in a number of proof request templates within BC Wallet. Um, right now in Bifold, there's no template, so it's up to each uh, wallet distributor to, to, to define their own. Um, for BC Wallet, we've decided to create or proof request template around the credentials that we can have, which is the lawyer credential and the person credential. So I'm gonna do uh, perhaps a zero knowledge proof that, uh, that asks if uh, someone is over 18. There's a little bit of typo here. It says over 19, but it's actually requests over 18. So it generates a proof request. It generates a QR code and within with my other phone, I will then scan this QR code Oh, and I use a credential that I don't have. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to get that from another wallet. Okay, uh, I will decline, and I'll go through the this showcase and get another set of credentials. We're currently have been working on these features kind of very actively. So one of the questions that one of the things that we're working on is the in the credential branding, OCA branding. And one of the things that we are working on is uh, we have a, a number of showcase and demo credentials um, is we're trying to we're experimenting with how to make those credentials, uh, how to highlight that they're not for production. Um, so that's something that is um, ongoing. I uh, will generate a new QR code on the left side. Okay, there you go. So now I've created a proof request. I can then share that information back to the ver mobile verifier on the left hand side. It takes a little bit. Uh, but that information then has been received. Um, it gives that green banner. It has been, again, all the cryptographic signature and the requirement has been validated. Uh, therefore, it gives that, that green banner, which you should always get. Um, we're working with the concept of maybe this is, uh, uh, you're working a kiosk and, and you are, you're trying to, to validate a number of people uh, one after the other. There is always an option to generate a next one and maybe the next person in line can then scan a QR code, um, share the credential and so on. And, and you always have an option to keep going, generate a QR code, validate next and so on. Um, okay, so now I will go back. The other way that you can do that mobile verify is I can create a connection and then I'm gonna be connecting connecting first with the device. And then from here, uh, we do have the messaging um, available. So I sh let me go back here. So I see the message, I can type a message one side, it's gonna show on the other side and so on. So from the mobile verifier, if I already have a, uh, a connection, I can send, also send a proof request from here. And this one will not create a QR code, it's just send a proof request. I'll do the same proof request here, send this proof request. Just gonna go back a little bit. I received the proof request. I'll share that information, not the verifier. We now have that information. They have now the option to open and see the information that has been shared. Um, and I'll stop here. We are almost over time and I'll give a couple minutes for questions. That was great demos, Clacio. Really interesting to see the um, 
the flow of using your credential to access court records and the zero knowledge proof and messaging to a very nice interface and user experience. Yeah, a uh, user experience is something that we're very committed and we have been working quite significantly is uh, if we want to release that to the general public, it has to be very easy and simple for the average person to understand and go through the flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're getting to the end of the hour, but does anybody have any questions in the last few minutes? I was just going to add to your point, Charles. I think this is very good to see. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, one quick question. Uh, do you have any sandbox that you can uh, let other people come and play in? Um, yes. So I'll paste that the link in, in the chat. Uh, that is public available. Anybody can can go and, and play with those uh, those flows. Um, as well as BC Wallet itself, it's it's public available. It's available on the app stores. Anybody can download them. Great, thanks. And I think the only thing I, I want to add in there is I think like especially when you're talking about you, you showing the uh, uh, the zero, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, oof, zero knowledge uh, proof. Yeah, thank you for helping me with that. So, so the ZKPs, uh, I mean, essentially, I think one thing I, I struggle with on there is that like. I mean, just showing somebody's name uh, in a lot of situations may not be enough, like, you know, because yes, I mean, if you're just going to a movie or something, or you can just flash a name and, and uh, maybe a picture, that's enough. But I think with the uh, combination of uh, fake IDs or with a fake, you know, pictures and all that coming in, I think the question becomes how much proof, additional proof you need, uh, you know, uh, to really show that it's like actually you, uh, you're not really showing somebody else's face, you're not really showing somebody else's name and things like, oh, I'm over 18 or I'm, I'm, I'm basically admitted to uh, uh, this place here because, well, here's a binary decision on that. So from, from our use case perspective, we begin lawyers, they, they follow the rules to the T because otherwise they are subjected to, to, to getting to their privilege to practice law revoked, right? Um, so, so there's a number of things here. There is the 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 the, the trust registry part or, or the governance side about the verifier needs to know what credential from what issuer they trust. So it's not just a matter of asking for an individual name or age. It's a matter of uh, of validating that information as well, or maybe ask the question about do you have the name from the um, member card issued by Law Society of BC. And the same thing for the person credential. You, I want that name from the per, from a person credential issued by the government of BC, as opposed to anybody who who can create a person scheme or anything like that. So it's a little bit of the governance around that that the verifier can codify that validation on their side. Um, as I said, we do leverage the 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 service BC identity proving process. Um, so that means either you have gone through the process of validate, uh, identify yourself that you are who you are in order to get that person credential. As I said, that's what raises the level of identity assurance. Um, and if the person is, if the person has given the authority to somebody else to use their credential, um, that's they're, they're already kind of a, in. In, it's almost like fraud. So again, they are subjected to, to the existing laws in place. Right. Now, I, I think I'll probably get my some questions in because I'm sorry, I also have a hot stuff, but I do have some follow-up questions. I'll probably circle back. Uh, um, and I think maybe one quick question, Shah. Uh, Shah, I'm assuming you're going to capture these uh, links here and uh, place them on a wiki? Yeah, I will do that straight after the call. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, it. absolutely. Wonderful. Any other questions? Uh, I'll start. Can you please put my information, contact information on the agenda on the wiki? Yes, if, I will if do that. If somebody want to reach out, maybe they can they can reach out to my email. Yeah, absolutely. I will make sure that that is on there.
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Clacio, for a great demo and presentation. Super interesting to hear about. And thank you all for joining the call and for jumping in with working group status updates. And yeah, we'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you, Shara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks.